guys. Today I am coming to you guys with a clothing haul. I went shopping a couple days ago and literally went insane and bought so many things. It wasn't even a question, it was just like fate. I just had to get it. Like if it could levitate towards me, it would have levitated. I got this skirt, bright yellow. It's a jean button up thing. And I just love this. I just loved it, loved it, loved it. It's a gray knit sweater and it has pink hearts all over it. I loved, I love tie-dye things. Like tie-dye things are literally the bomb.net. It has a little yin yang sign on the front of it. I just love these so much. I need to stop. Type the word haul into YouTube and you'll have over 29 million different videos to choose from. Haul videos are ranked the fourth most popular type of video online. If you're unfamiliar with haul videos, the majority involve a person who usually identifies as female, showing their audience recent fashion and beauty purchases. The majority of these clothes are bought from fast fashion and regular high street brands, sometimes simply showing the items and sometimes showing us a demonstration of how they will be worn. The quality isn't all that great, but the prices are fantastic. Most of these influencers, especially the most popular ones, already have huge collections of cosmetics and clothes and are constantly buying more and more. I have a problem! A fucking bag of Supreme. I got these. Oh! No, I just think this is amazing. I find it really interesting because even though these videos get the number of views that are comparable to major TV channels, so little has ever been written or said about them from a very critical perspective. So in this video, I really wanna talk about some of the problems with haul videos and the fast fashion that they promote, but I also wanna talk about some of the problems with the anti-haul, haul alternative, ethical fashion, ethical consumerism movements that are often presented as solutions to fast fashion fashion. We've already seen that YouTubers have an extreme influence on purchasing behaviour. When a popular YouTuber recommends a product, it's sold out in minutes. And studies have found that haul videos are more influential to followers than the editors of Teen Vogue, with 66% of beauty product buyers being influenced by YouTube advertisers to make purchases. But when influencers in haul videos show off their clothes, they rarely ever discuss the environmental or ethical impacts of the clothes that they are consuming. Fashion today is the number two most polluting industry on earth, second only to the oil industry. The wars of the future will not be fought about oil. The wars of the future is gonna be fought about water. We are committing hydrocide. We are deliberately murdering our rivers. Our rivers across the world were being deeply impacted by the dumping of poisonous, toxic material. Every single piece of clothing that you buy comes with a cost. The fabric dyes used to contain hazardous materials, things like mercury, cadmium, and lead. These kind of chemicals, they don't break down and they travel around the world. This water is so toxic, there is no aquatic life. If you see how people are living there, they have lost their sensory adaptation. They can't smell anymore. They do have problems with drinking water supply. There's a high incidence of liver cancers. If we continue like this, it's done. It's done. The statistics are insane. Something like 80 billion garments of clothes are being delivered out of factories. So the pipe is underground. You cannot really see this factory that is dumping this. This water is being put into this irrigation canal, so this has entered the food chain. It's estimated that one in every six people alive in the world today work in some part of the global fashion industry, making it the most labor-dependent industry on Earth. You know, we are actually profiting from their um, need to work, to use them as slaves. <laughs> factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. Clashes between clothes factory workers and riot police in Cambodia. Last November, 112 people were killed in another major factory fire. 30,000 Chinese workers and little pregnant. Garment workers in Bangladesh are paying the price for cheap clothing. A 
Aside from the environmental impact of the production of these clothes, the cheaper these clothes have become and the constant new trends has made clothes seem disposable in a way it never did before. The global marketplace is some place where we export work to have happen in whatever conditions we want and then the products come back to me cheap enough to throw away without thinking about it. The average American throws away 82 pounds of textile waste each year adding up to more than 11 million tons of textile waste from the U.S. alone. Most of this waste is non-biodegradable, meaning it sits in landfills for 200 years or more while releasing harmful gases into the air. You know, the journey of a t-shirt donated to charity is unpalatable in itself. It turns out that only about 10% of the clothes that we donate actually get sold in local thrift stores. Now more of it is being dumped into developing countries the local clothing industry here has disappeared. What charities can't sell or give away is often sold by the ton to buyers in the developing world. Even there, much of last year's fashion is filling this year's landfills. Sometimes they pack even very old items and they, they end up dumping them in, in Africa or in Kenya. Yeah, we burn them. And now many of those countries are fighting back. East African countries sent the world a message recently. They don't want our hand-me-downs and tried to ban them. Their government said it was destroying their own textile market. So as South Africa is concerned, we banned second-hand clothing. When a country survives on second-hand things, second-hand clothes, it means there's something wrong with that system. Threatening the survival of the local textiles industry, any manufactured uh, textile would not be able to compete with them. And with the flooding of Western culture in clothing, there's also a form of Western imperialism of beauty standards. We see the selling of the westernized image as the badge of modernity in India, in Singapore, in China, in Japan, where the notion of how you join globalized culture is the taking of a Western body. Another problem with donations, and I've definitely experienced this, is that we feel like we've done our bit in the world, so it can prevent us from giving in more meaningful and less harmful ways. In the last few years, some of the biggest names in the business, Levi's, Nike, Adidas, Zara, have started recycling programs. Cool, but almost 90% of clothes end up trashed or burnt, so H&M gets to look green but they also get you to shop more by giving you a discount to buy even more shit you'll soon be recycling. So many of the green claims they make are meaningless. And they do that by having words that have no set definition. Right here, this little dot mm -hmm. means recycled materials. Mm -hmm. But it only is this tag. <gasps> Look, it would take 12 years to recycle what they sell in 48 hours. Like it's just, it's just, so that what sort of tells me it's really more about foot traffic, marketing, greenwashing than about really addressing the, the broken business model of fast fashion. A lot of the time the people in these videos aren't even sure if they like the items that they're selling, but it's cheap so they keep it. It's just this really pretty light blue sweater. I don't even know if I'm going to wear this now that I got it because I don't know if I like it that much. A lot of the time they do huge wardrobe clearouts to make room for new items, not thinking about where their clothes come from or will end up. In the past, clothes were something that we held onto for a very long time, but haul videos helps to normalize and reproduce a throwaway culture and perpetuates the idea that clothing is disposable and that we should constantly be buying more and more things that we don't need. And it completely ignores the ways in which these clothes are sewn with the blood of millions of people whose lives are brutal, unjust and short. I'm sure we're all kind of sick of all the depressing statistics that we have just 10 years to prevent irreversible climate catastrophe and that 1% of the world's population has as much as the bottom 50%. In order to reach these goals, we need to be doing exactly the opposite of what these videos are promoting. We need to get rid of mass consumerism. We need a complete reversal in our economic system based on infinite growth on a finite planet. 
But the problem is that the more that we see the people that we look up to, like YouTubers, perpetuate and ignore these problems, the more that we get the message that it's totally okay for us to do the same and not care about the fact that there's billions of people who are in indescribable anguish as a result of this system and ignore the fact that our earth can't sustain this level of continued growth. I think this problem is far bigger than we could imagine because psychologists have found that humans evolved living in social groups and we like to validate the correctness of our actions based on comparisons with the people around us. And YouTubers have such a big influence on shaping social norms because if we see that some of the most viewed videos on YouTube are haul videos and we see YouTubers with thousands of subscribers engaging in so much consumerism, not caring about who died for their clothes clothing, we're also going to think it's totally okay for us to do the same, even if we're incredibly informed about the impact it's having on people and the planet. So even if we don't care about the environmental and social impact, it doesn't even make us happy to be consuming and to have materialistic values. What we now know 20 years later and hundreds of studies later is that the more that people are focused on those materialistic values, the more that they say that money and image and status and possessions are important to them, the less happy they are, the more depressed they are, the more anxious they are. We know that all of these kinds of psychological problems tend to go up as materialistic values go up. Now, that's really at odds with the thousands of messages that we receive every day from uh, advertisements suggesting that materialism and the pursuit of possessions and owning stuff is what's going to make us happy. And the more time we spend consuming or seeking to consume, the less time or energy we have for other things like learning about the world, social issues, helping in our communities and our planet, or just enjoying our lives. Excessive hauling, glorifying over shopping also teaches us to think and act individually, to be greedy and selfish, and can also lead to excessive self-interest and narcissism in people. Lifestyle videos such as haul videos are intended to be aspirational and we often look at these people as our role models, wanting to achieve the perfection we think that they have. When we watch these videos, we often feel relative deprivation. We want to be like the person in the video. We want to have the things they have. These videos constantly create new needs in us, making us want to buy more. We may feel that discrepancy sometimes, but then a new video will come up and a new need will arise. These influencers often link the clothes that they're talking about to real human needs. So we're all given the impression that through purchasing these clothes, we can have great friends, a great relationship, Relationship, be happy and fulfilled. It's often seemed to me that a person who feels happy and secure isn't going to be a very good consumer because that person isn't going to be looking for products to shore up uh, the self-image or to feel better about oneself. This type of advertising can be even more insidious than ordinary ads because it's often more intimate as these YouTubers market themselves as more genuine celebrities and give us the older sister vibe. If you are trying to sell something to someone, you have to make some connection with that person. And if you are a private equity firm who owns this company, whose only corporate existence is a filing cabinet in Panama City, it's very hard <laughs> for people to make that connection yeah, yeah. and to say, oh yeah, I, I, I relate to that, I want to be part of this. So mm. what do you do? You bring in someone who pretends to be your friend. You think, this is my friend. Sure. She's talking to me. I know her because I see her all the time. I see her more often than I see my next door neighbor. Mm. And so you become embedded and imbued in, in, in her life and her culture, even though she's not remotely connected with yours and probably wouldn't want to be in a million years. Mm because she probably thinks you're scum, basically. And I remember when I used to watch these when I was a teenager, I didn't understand that the YouTubers were profiting from affiliate links when I clicked on the products that they were promoting. So a lot of us take their reactions at face value and think, wow, this can make this person so happy. 
Clearly, because the YouTuber is displaying this, and maybe it can make me happy too. And obviously, some people may just find these videos incredibly entertaining, and that's totally valid, but how many times do we actually come away from these videos feeling good about ourselves? Young people, especially young girls, are becoming overexposed to these unrealistic beauty and lifestyle standards, and I've even found research that shows that the comment sections of these YouTube videos have an oversaturation of comments about the beauty and the sweetness and cuteness of these YouTubers. And through this, it's again perpetuating these gender stereotypes of what a woman has to be and look like in order to be seen as valid. And the more that we're taught to focus on and become obsessed with our appearance, the more financial and physical sacrifices we make in order to achieve these unrealistic goals, and the more our ambitions in life reduce, things like feminist and human rights issues and environmental issues become a lesser priority over time. Often buying these clothes and living this type of lifestyle is sold to us as a form of female empowerment. It's seen as a feminist act of love, a form of self-expression, and of course clothing can be an amazing form of self-expression but it's a pretty disturbing form of white feminism considering the fact that the majority of these clothes are made by women and children working in unsafe conditions for 14 hours a day and for just a couple of dollars experiencing assault and abuse on a daily basis. And there are people from marginalized backgrounds that are providing greater representation, but as I spoke about in my body positivity video, the overemphasis on empowerment and inclusion and representation often detracts from the very real structural conditions that need to change in order for us to actually genuinely deal with the problem. And of course, we aren't all helpless, hapless victims that absorb all of this uncritically. Of course, we can think for ourselves, but at the same time, when we we're bombarded with these messages absolutely everywhere and there are so few dissenting voices on YouTube and in our consumer driven society in general, it would take a lot for us to believe that our worth isn't purely based on our appearance. At the same time, shaming these influencers and shaming us for consuming fast fashion often feels like another form of misogyny, blaming us for being too superficial or too shallow, which is just a superficial analysis when you take into account the fact that we've been indoctrinated our whole lives to care so much and be so obsessed with achieving the ideal beauty. And if you look at the top 100 female influencers, almost all of them are successful based on capitalizing on their appearance. Within this system, this is often the only choice left for women to get ahead in the world. Are those buyers immoral or do they just don't, or are they amoral? The system they're working for and the system that allows companies to do this is amoral. The individuals concerned are simply products of that system and having to drive it through to its logical conclusion. What we need to do is change the way those companies operate. In order to counter some of the problems with haul videos and fast fashion, anti-haul videos, sustainable haul and haul alternatives have emerged, focusing on boycotting fast fashion brands and promoting sustainable consumption instead. An increasing number of channels talk about ethical fashion, second-hand shopping, better greener lifestyles, zero waste movements, even documentaries discussing the true cost of haul videos and fast fashion turn to ethical consumption as the answer. It's this pervasive idea that we can change the world through changing our buying habits. Framing these things as the solution makes me incredibly frustrated because although I think shopping ethically is a great thing to do, capitalism is inherently based off of endless growth and endless profit and no matter how much we make clothes sustainable, even if everyone in the world started shopping sustainably, capitalism will still inevitably lead to the destruction of our planet. Regardless of what particular variety of capitalism you're facing, Capitalism is destroying the living planet. And if it's a sort of social democratic capitalism, it might take a few years longer than if it's a neoliberal capitalism. 
but it's still heading in exactly the same direction. And no matter how ethical a company tries to be, competition forces companies to continuously cut costs, choose cheaper and cheaper labour, which generally means the most inhumane ones, where workers are paid the least amount of money in the worst kinds of conditions. If they don't cut costs, they will be pushed out of the market by competition. When everything is concentrated on making profits, for the big corporations. What you see is that human rights, the environment, workers' rights get lost altogether. You see that workers are increasingly exploited because the price of everything is pushed down and down and down just to satisfy the, this impulse to accumulate capital. And that's profoundly problematic because it leads to the mass impoverishment of hundreds of millions of people around the world. Pressure to cut costs also incentivizes companies to invest in labor-saving technology to gain competitive advantage. It's projected that by 2050, automation will have taken 50% of all the world's jobs. Capitalism also needs a significant level of the population to be living in poverty and unemployment. The so-called reserve army of labour is kept barely alive so that wages can decrease even further because workers compete for jobs. And workers don't try to organise and demand better for fear of losing their jobs. If you look around the world where the garment industry is flourishing, what attracts the garment industry, it tends to be where the rule of law is weakest and where people are so desperately poor that on mass, they're almost willing to work under any conditions. It's not indentured slavery or servitude, but in a way it is. Throughout the supply chain, an incredible amount of money is being made by these brands. A significant amount of money is being made by the factories. The workers are nowhere near a living wage, and that's where the margins are. And it's also not as simple as calling for more environmental or labour regulations or organising in trade unions or NGOs, because although I'm all for reforms as much as possible, if workers start to organise and demand better conditions, corporations can simply replace them with other workers or move their business elsewhere to a country with more favourable conditions for doing business. So all of this has given corporations the ability to endlessly push down wages and cut environmental regulations because suppliers are played off against each other in the insatiable demand for lower costs and higher profits. And none of the disturbing environmental or labour scandals lead to any meaningful change because corporations use subcontractors so they can say they're not directly involved. They had no idea. It allows them to get away with extreme forms of exploitation and suffering. As story after story of clothing factory disasters kept filling the news, it was now the case that three of the four worst tragedies in the history of fashion had all happened in the last year. As the death toll rose, so did the profits generated. The year following the disaster at Rana Plaza was the industry's most profitable of all time. The Cambodian government, like other developing countries, are desperate for the business that multinational retailers bring. Because of the constant threat that these brands will relocate production to other low-cost countries, the government holds down wages, routinely avoiding enforcement of local labor laws. But because the major brands do not officially employ the workers, or own any of the factories they produce in, they are able to profit hugely, all while remaining free of responsibility for the effects of poverty wages, factory disasters, and the ongoing violent treatment of workers. The whole system begins to feel like a perfectly engineered nightmare for the workers trapped inside of it. The majority of workers across the globe have no choice because they'd be endangering their jobs and therefore their lives and the lives of their families. All of this is a new form of colonialism, where the entire third world has basically been created as global sweatshops for the West. Some people say that giving aid will solve the situation, but the aid budget is ridiculously low when compared to the amount of money flowing out of these countries. A lot of people argue that ethical consumerism can be a starting point to help people to dig deeper into structural conditions, and I think this definitely can be the case, but I also worry that without talking about the political problems, it can just help to divert people's attention from the real changes that need to be made in society. It it makes us feel better about ourselves, like we've done our bit, preventing us from taking part in meaningful political and collective action. 
Research has shown that the more that we try to be conscious consumers and buy green products, the less we actually engage in the political process. Encouraging people to consume better puts the onus on us as individuals, rather than the corporations and politicians and the system. Instead of us coming together to challenge structural issues, we often act very puritanically and condescendingly, scolding each other for not purchasing the right way, and we often end up alienating people who just aren't able to afford it. And if it were just swapping unethical products for ethical ones, it would be amazing, but instead two parallel markets have emerged, one for unethical products and one for ethical products, so nothing has really changed. Even if the whole of the UK started shopping ethically, corporations would simply start finding new markets abroad to sell their products to instead. We've already seen this happen with the tobacco industry. And the fact that the solution is just shopping differently seems so frivolous that so many of us are pacified, assuming that the problem of climate breakdown and the human cost of our consumption must just be really exaggerated, because otherwise wouldn't we be called to be doing more? If you don't change the system, you're leaving intact the decision-making of these enterprises, which means a small group of executives and shareholders are going to be working in the same system, subject to the same pattern of rewards and punishments, which will sooner or later make them reimpose there or elsewhere the very conditions you're fighting against. So stop this stuff about improving their conditions Deal with a system, or else you're not serious. I'm not saying you should stop watching these videos or that anyone that watches or creates these videos is a bad person. Not at all. Like I said, I used to watch these videos when I was a teenager too. But I'm just mostly frustrated because I feel like YouTube could be such a wonderful opportunity for us to counter the messages that we're usually always fed in this society. It could be a place for promoting open-mindedness and curiosity and intelligence and generosity and compassion. But instead, we are constantly bombarded with videos that just end up reproducing the same messages of consumerism and materialism and individualism that we're constantly fed our whole entire lives. All of this being said, haul videos are just one of the many ramifications of living under a capitalist system. We need to start building a new system if we are to have any hope of reducing and preventing the destruction of our planet and the exploitation of billions of people all across the globe. And when I talk about building a new system, people always immediately assume some sort of violent revolution or going to loads of boring leftist meetings and never getting anything done. But really, it means finding things that are joyful and meaningful to you. It can be anything from creating revolutionary art or poetry or music or helping in your local communities or in food banks and homeless shelters. It can be creating educational curriculums to teach people about the problems within our society. Literally anything that can help move us towards creating alternative ways of living in this world and help us to build a revolution from the ground up. I've linked in the description box below all the references for this video and any resources if you want to find out more about the things that I've talked about. And thank you so much for watching and taking the time to listen to me. Thank you so much to all of my patrons for making this video possible and for helping me to continue to make videos. I really appreciate that so much. And if you'd like to become a patron, I've linked that in the description box below. And I hope you all have a beautiful day. Bye.